Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth weekly roundup episode. This week, we'll be discussing uh, the coronavirus pandemic. We'll be talking about the current state of the U.S. general election, and then we'll be doing a deep dive into both a national and international current affair. So at the national level, we'll be talking about Trump's current uh, TikTok deal with Oracle. And on the international level, we'll be talking about uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, new imposition of sanctions on Iran and the impact that has on the greater Middle East region. So we, we'll start out with the coronavirus pandemic on a global level. Uh, we've currently exceeded over 30 million cases. Uh, deaths continue to be in the 900K range, uh, but fortunately, almost 23 million people have recovered. Uh, we see that the daily new cases, unfortunately, seem to have an uptick again. And some of that is due to uh, the never-ending crisis in India, where unfortunately does not appear that the numbers in India have slowed down. But it's also partly because cases in Europe have been rising at a rather scary rate. It seemed like they had it under control, but numbers are still going up right now in the UK, in France, Italy, Spain, Germany, quite a few countries in Europe are seeing a rebound there. Daily deaths seem to be plateauing. Uh, so unfortunately, it does not appear that uh, any kind of increased antivirals or even the developments in the vaccine race, uh, unfortunately, we don't see mortality rates falling uh, to any level that we would be expecting uh, six months into the pandemic. Now, currently, it appears that it's still the same four countries, the United States leading the pack, India closely behind, Brazil and Russia. These are the four countries that have now hit over a million total cases. Uh, we see that the numbers in the U.S. seem to be plateauing somewhere in the 30 to 40 K range, uh, but still much higher, much higher than where we were at a low point back in late May. Uh, India, again, those numbers do not seem to be going down, unfortunately. So we don't really know what's going on in India, but it appears that uh, they do not have this pandemic under control there yet. Brazil, fortunately, numbers are continuing to decrease there. So that's some good news. Although Russia, despite their claim that they won the vaccine race, they're still averaging way over a thousand cases at about 6,000 cases per day. So we don't really see any real improvement in Russia either. So there's a real question mark about the vaccine development there. Uh, here in the United States, uh, unfortunately, we've continued to hit new records. Uh, we're already at over 7 million cases here in the United States, 7 million total cases. Deaths have finally crossed uh, the 200K range. And if you'll remember, uh, doc Dr. Deborah Burks back in March had said that a uh, prognosis of total deaths was anywhere between 100K to 240K. That was the original prediction. So we are now at over 200K six months into the pandemic. Now, uh, we do see that daily cases, there was a period of time for about two months from late June, July to about now when it seemed like things were slowing down. But now what's happening is they're sort of plateauing at the 35,000 average cases per day. Uh, there's actually been a slight uptick over the last week, so we don't really know where this is going to go, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the situation is improving that much. Uh, same situation with daily new death. Once again, uh, we don't really see a significant decline. Uh, you know, again, it seems like deaths are significantly lower than where they were in April, but they're still in the 1,000 range. So a lot of improvements can be made in this area. Uh, Really quickly, Mark, I wanted to get your opinion on what's happening right now in Europe. There was a lot of talk about how the lockdown there was going to work, but unfortunately, there's a there's a massive increase again. So what can the U.S. learn from the current uh, increase in cases in Europe? Well, the first thing that we can learn from um, Europe is that we can't be too cocky and assume that things are going down that we can just start opening up again, that we still need to be cautious about the virus and we need to be thinking about the capabilities of hospitals, make sure that we don't over flood hospitals with patients. We don't want a repeat of what happened near the beginning of this pandemic. But just a, a warning saying that this thing isn't over and until we have a cure or a vaccine, 
and we should still remain cautious. And Evan, we've seen that there's been new developments in the vaccine race. I want to get your opinion on the geopolitics, so especially with regard to China's new vaccine, which is now uh, almost finished phase three trials. Uh, most of the results have been extremely positive, and they are now distributing their vaccine for emergency use in the United Arab Emirates, in Indonesia, uh, in Brazil, and several of those countries that are Chinese allies. What are your thoughts on this, and what impact do you think it has on America's role in the world? Well, as we discussed actually in our very first episode, China, their culture is all about face. So the fact that their vaccine is in phase three trials to me is a attempt, a gesture at reconciliation, which is also uh, conveniently a way for them to extend their geopolitical influence. I am at the same time surprised and I'm surprised if you can believe it at the lag time that the United States has taken. They've really been dragging their feet in their own vaccine development uh, department. In the episode where we discussed Russia's progress on the vaccine, I was very, very skeptical. But and to a degree, I'm skeptical about the actual progress of the Chinese vaccine, but since they seem to be so eager to circulate it, I highly doubt that there has been any form of extraordinary negligence. I wouldn't be surprised if it had been rushed out the door because I think that's just the way medical bureaucracy works now. So we might see some complications as uh, more and more people have access to it and there's more and more access to data whether rather than uh, data that is uh, spoon fed from uh, vetted Chinese medical officials. So time time will tell. I'm I'm holding my breath. I'm not going to be uh, particularly condemning or particularly forgiving about China's role. Their incredibly their undeniable role in this virus spreading so internationally so quickly early this year. But this is definitely, in my opinion, a power move for them, not a pure humanitarian effort. But uh, vaccine is definitely progress, especially since so many governments have been so easily leveraged by the fear of the virus. Perhaps some modicum of normalcy will come from uh, this new development in a COVID-19 vaccine. What's really interesting is that the UK-led effort, which they asked had released their AstraZeneca vaccine, and there was actually a lot of promising data. Unfortunately, they had a case where there seemed to have been one patient who had side effects, so they actually had to slow down uh, phase three for, for AstraZeneca. They're currently redoubling their efforts to uh, research what went wrong. Um, so this is obviously not good news, I think, for the UK. I, I don't even know for the United States if it's necessarily a good thing that China is clearly leading in the vaccine race. I mean, obviously, it's wonderful news for China and their allies, uh, but for the U.S., I mean, especially given uh, the lack of progress that we're seeing from Pfizer, from Moderna, uh, from some of these, you know, companies that had skyrocketing stock prices, and yet right now we're really not, not seeing the kind of progress that we're seeing in China vaccine race. Like you said, I think it's too early to say whether this was an enormous success for China. But if it is, it obviously would dampen America's image both internally and abroad, given the U.S. has really viciously gone after the World Health Organization and refused to collaborate uh, with other countries. Uh, China has said, you know, we're going to give this out for free uh, or we're going to do, do this for a very low price. The U.S. has basically said, no vaccine for any other country except for us. We are the priority. So we'll see if Trump's America first thing ends up uh, paying out for what he what he really wants, uh, putting America first. Now, let's talk about some of the polling data here at the U.S. election, uh, which is going to be happening in six weeks. Now, in just one week, we're actually going to be having the first presidential debate. Uh, 
uh, between President Trump and Democrat Joe Biden will act at first on the current state at the national level. The president is still underwater. It seems like his approval rating has gone up a little bit. He's at 46 percent, but 49 percent disapproved. So negative three there, which is actually a lot better than, than where he was at least a couple weeks ago. Uh, but unfortunately, in the national poll, in the popular vote, he's still down 10 points. And it appears that apart from some of those very red states like Texas, Georgia, and Ohio, which are the current three swing states that he's still leading in, and some of those other really ruby red states, uh, the president is down everywhere else, right? He's, he's behind in Florida, he's behind even in North Carolina, and he's you know, massively behind in those Rust Belt states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. He's even significantly behind in Arizona. I think Arizona is really shocking. Again, a very red state that has not voted Democrats since 1992. So it's been 28 years. And now Joe Biden opening up a significant lead in Arizona, which would actually uh, allow him to afford losing some of those Rust Belt states, which he's also leading. In. So from an electoral college perspective, not a lot of good news for the president. Uh, if we look at the down ballot elections, it seems like uh, Republicans are still leading uh, where they would be leading traditionally. They're leading in Texas, Montana, the Georgia special election, and Kentucky. Those are all Senate races. Uh, but Democrats are now ahead in Minnesota, Iowa, Arizona, Maine, North Carolina, Michigan, Virginia, and Colorado, which actually means that they will be picking up significant uh, Senate seats, uh, which will also have an enormous impact on this new Supreme Court vacancy. So not good news for Republicans in the Senate. Because if these polls do hold, what it means is they're definitely picking up Iowa. They're also going to pick up Arizona, Maine, North Carolina, and possibly even Colorado. So that's plus five. And if we do the math, we say that Republicans still somehow be able to win back that as plus four, which means they take control of the, uh, of the chamber uh, in, in January 2021. South Carolina being a real shocker because that is Lindsey Graham's seat. And Lindsey Graham's been getting a lot of hatred uh, for his position on the Supreme Court, uh, especially with regard to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So either slightly before the election or after the election during the lame duck session, uh, Lindsey Graham being very, very aggressive about that Supreme Court seat. And we don't know if that's going to hurt him or help him, but the race is currently tied there. So he's not in a good position in South Carolina. Republicans are also leading in Montana, Missouri, and Utah in gubernatorial races, but Democrats lead in North Carolina, which is a very, very, very important swing state. Uh, and in, in the generic House ballot, Democrats are also up by five. So uh, current projections still have them easily holding on to the House. Now, Mark, I want to start with you. What are your thoughts on uh, the impact that uh, Justice Ginsburg's passing will have on the elections in November? Do you think it's going to increase turnout? Do you think it's going to help President Trump? Or do you think it's going to hurt him? Well, I definitely think that the Supreme Court vacancy will encourage more people, I think on both sides, not just the Democrats, but also Republicans to go out and vote, given that this election has just become even more important than, than it already was. You know, we have all these different Senate seats that are competing against each other, and it might look positive for the Democrats in the Senate and even in the presidential election, which makes the Supreme Court vacancy even more important for Republicans to secure now before January 20th. Now, Trump doesn't, like, need to rush this Um before the election, which is in like six weeks, he still is president until January 20th, and that's like in four months. So he has plenty of time to put in a final Supreme Court justice as his final act as president. So we still have plenty of time to see what President Trump does. We still have to look at the election results that will come out uh, in six weeks. So everything's just up in the air right now. And this year has just gotten even more important than ever before. Yeah, I gotta say, 2020 does not like activists. <laughs> um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, John Lewis, 
Herman Cain, Chadwick Boseman. Uh, I don't know if you would call Kobe Bryant an activist just as much as a, a living example of uh, uh, African-American excellence in any industry, not even just the sporting industry. But unfortunately, in the case of Justice Ginsburg, her passing has been rife with double standards, and it has uh, definitely not served to simplify or uh, lower the stakes of this election. Let's just say that much. It's going to be a big feather in Trump's, ca in, in Trump's cap for his existing voter base if he can get a third justice. Because remember, ju justices are appointed for life. So conceivably, uh, cases and decisions made by the third justice that Trump appoints, uh, their consequences are going to be for the next conceivably at least 20, 30 years permanent. Um, until until they are overturned in a future landmark case, which could that that could be forty years away. It could be a hundred years away. We don't know. So it's definitely a, a big power move trying to get a third justice. But I I will say the uh, the irony of partisanship here is palpable. Uh, when the uh, circumstances were reversed in the passing of Justice Scalia in 2016, the Democrats were all diehard. Uh, we uh, we gotta uh, get uh, get the replacement nominated before the end of Obama's presidency. We have a, a constitutional obligation. Hillary Clinton actually said this, by the way, a constitutional obligation, and uh, Trump today is using those same words and even democrats are calling out uh say they they called out um uh republican senate leaders when they were uh, defending waiting until the election in order to appoint a replacement for scalia uh, which ended up being neil gorsuch so to me it's on the whole been frankly disappointing the the blatant uh, inauthenticity uh, surrounding the uh, open seat of Justice Ginsburg uh, now that she has uh, uh, succumbed to pancreatic cancer. So we can only hope that this uh, actual conceivable ninth justice uh, won't just be uh, a political pundit in a robe appointed for life, that they will actually have some uh, some tack and neutrality. So I think that, you know, one of the really big challenges right now is our nation has already been so divided, right? It, it's been so divided by COVID-19. It's been so divided by these uh, racial justice protests. Uh, add on to that the economic social inequalities that's been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And you look at you know, a depression that is now com comparable to the Great Depression about uh, 90 years ago, uh, climate change really you know, attacking uh, the entire West Coast of the United States with these wildfires and also hurricanes in the Southeast. So the country is really on the brink. Uh, and the question is, can we even withstand you know, another uh, uh, crisis of legitimacy in our institutions? you know, with this potential for a 6-3 uh, fully conservative Supreme Court. And I, I say that in the sense that Justice Roberts, if we remember, although he's obviously conservative, he has moved to the center on quite a few issues. He's actually changed his opinions on topics. Uh, Obamacare being another one. Judge Amy Coney Barrett, on the court in, in January, then we're talking about a fully conservative Supreme Court where you have five justices who absolutely will rule to the right wing in pretty much every single instance. And that is some, uh, last time we had a really strong partisan lean in our courts uh, was uh, the Warren Court, which was a very liberal court in the 70s, and that's actually when they started pushing forward, uh, you know, Roe v. Wade and also laws on affirmative action. So we'll see what this
especially the administration is only going to continue. And I think the question for the president right now is, if I move forward with a nomination, yes, you know, I can increase my Republican base and get them really riled up and show them there's a cost to not voting in November. But the, the flip side of that is that, you know, basically kryptonite uh, to the Democrats. Well, think about 2018, right? You put Kavanaugh on the court. And Democrats turned out in mass and they won the House in a landslide bill for Democrats to do the same thing in 2020, where they really come out at even higher numbers, perhaps Obama era numbers uh, would be devastating for the Republican Party electorally. So Trump has sort of a really difficult choice to for this. To prioritize that over the court and I'll let the American people decide. Now, currently, we know that uh, Senators Murkowski and Collins, both of whom are pro Republicans, so they're very centrist Republicans, have come out and said they're not going to vote uh, for a justice uh, before the November election. But that's only two, right? Republicans have a 53 seat majority in the Senate. So, really, it's going to take four defections uh, to derail Mitch McConnell's plans to. It. And we'll have to wait till the presidential debate to de determine what kind of real impact it has uh, on our elections. Now, I want to talk about something that's been going on for basically the last two months, uh, but it seems like we finally have a conclusion now on the whole TikTok scandal. Uh, so TikTok, if, for those of you who don't know, is arguably the most popular app in America right now. In fact, it's the most downloaded app in both the Google Play Store and the Apple Store. It has over 100 million downloads, and it is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. So TikTok is very rare in the sense that it's the first Chinese app that's been able to really enter Western markets and dominate. Uh, Chinese technology historically has not been very successful in Western markets, but TikTok is an exception. And that has actually aroused a lot of fear in the Trump administration and certain members of Congress uh, who right now are really pushing this Cold War rhetoric on China, uh, that they don't want any kind of Chinese company being able to get so much access to American data. So President Trump basically said, you're going to have to make a deal with an American company, and TikTok did. They made a deal with Oracle. And this deal was actually a couple days ago. Uh, today, the president actually came out and approved the deal personally. So for all intents and purposes, TikTok will not be banned. So this is really good news for Gen Z because Gen Z loves TikTok. This is really an app that has incredible right? uh, whole context, right, with TikTok. It's bigger than just TikTok. When we talk about China and the U.S. currently locked in this technological trade war, uh, we are also talking about this parent company, ByteDance, uh, which has increased its influence around the world just over the last couple of years. And you look at the Chinese stock market, which is exploding right now, um, technology in China, uh, really just sort of completely destroying the Western narrative about how Chinese tech is inferior. Now the narrative is that China might even surpass us. And so there's really an effort by certain members of the administration, the more conservative members, uh, to suppress China's technological developments uh, and to contain China's influence here in the United States. And we've also seen this with Huawei, which is a very, very popular uh, mobile phone company, uh, a huge uh, competitor to Samsung and Apple and other uh, phone developers. Now, Huawei is now ranked number one in market capitalization internationally. It is now the most popular phone brand which is why the United States decided to ban them a couple of years ago. And now recently, they've also been going on a crusade against their, their 5G. So uh, Huawei also having enormous, uh, getting a lot of anger from the United States. And we've seen them going to American allies, the UK, Australia, France, Canada, and saying, do not use Huawei gear. Now, some of them have agreed, others have not. Uh, so that tech war is still going on. The bottom line is, it has been a very, very aggressive 
Trump administration towards China. The, the policy has changed. Uh, we don't really see the cooperation of the Obama era anymore. Um, what's really interesting, though, and this is something I think our listeners will, will need to take note, is that Trump's efforts to attack Chinese apps, including TikTok and WeChat, have not been successful, right? Oracle's deal with TikTok actually gives ByteDance over 80 percent ownership. So, so China still has 80 percent ownership over this app. Uh, so it's a 20 percent sale. Oracle and Walmart will be able to deal with American data. They hold on to the American data, but the source code, the AI app is really good news for China and pretty bad news for Trump in the sense that he didn't end up getting what he wanted. Uh, he also tried to ban WeChat. Uh, unfortunately for him, that ban was uh, basically blocked by an American federal judge who said that it violated First Amendment rights here in the United States. So that also uh, hitting a brick wall. And finally, uh, the World Trade Organization recently ruled just this week against Trump's tariffs. We all know that in July 2018, the president initiated a trade war, a unilateral trade war against China, accusing them of trade manipulation, of currency manipulation, and intellectual property theft. Um, and, and really saying that because of these things, America will now levy tariffs on Chinese goods. The World Trade Organization, which the U.S. was actually a founding member, China only joined in 2001, has now ruled against the American tariff. His trade war with China, there's been a lot of developments uh, once. Uh, I do want to ask, Mark, what are your thoughts on uh, this whole TikTok deal? Do you think it really deals with those security concerns, or do you think that it was all just politics? I think that most of this is just political and economical. I don't think that the personal data of the American people will actually remain private. I think it's just going to change hands from the Chinese government getting that directly to having the u.s government get that information our private information directly so it's really up to the american people to really read the terms of service of any apps that they use before they use it it's really up to us to be careful with our information we can't really trust the government to protect our privacy we have to do that ourselves so i don't think that any nation is really concerned with the actual privacy of their citizens so it's all this is mostly just trump being able to say that he was economically harsh on china without actually doing anything for the american people believe it or not are some virtues to be said of unitary powers uh China works much better as a nationalistic country than ours because uh, through suppression of free speech, their government approval rating is actually much, much higher there than, than ours. But at the same time, we're just talking about individuals. I would much rather my personal information be in the hands of the U.S. government than, than in, the C, in the hands of the CCP. But that said, I again, we're talking about data being in the hands of one major government institution in and then another i although am still naive enough to think that there might be those in the government that value people's personal privacy and their uh, right to it highly doubt that that's what they're after even if we actually get uh, privacy and control over our own data i highly doubt that that's an intentional objective so it's uh, mainly as Mark said, uh, culture moves, power moves, uh, hawkish stance on China. So uh, this episode is this episode is full of cynicism today. Yeah, I got to say that you know it's interesting because you talk talk about data security and even before the data for Americans is actually stored here in the United States with a backup in Singapore, but none of the data actually goes to China. Uh, so even from a, a, a factual, scientific data science perspective on this thing, uh, th there isn't any real evidence that, that 
TikTok was ever sending data to China. Uh, so a lot of it was fear mongering. I do understand the legitimate security, national security fears about any kind of foreign company from any country in the world coming into the United States and having enormous market power. I mean, you talk about uh, you know being able to uh, basically control an entire industry. That is definitely something that uh, scares a lot of people. But you also correctly have mentioned the hypocrisy here of you know organizations such as the NSA also you know, snooping in, and also you know with documented cases we have actually evidence in that situation where there's actual spying happening. Whereas in the TikTok situation, we haven't gotten any hard evidence. Um, you know there has been some talk about how their source code might have back doors, um, but that's been disputed by other computer scientists. So that's still a conversation that needs to continue to be had. Uh, but now that you know Oracle has already controlled uh, you know, from my personal opinion, I, I really don't see how far this can go anymore. I really see this sort of as a compromise for both countries, but from a geopolitical standpoint, I don't really see what America gained in this. this unnecessary fight, which okay, all it does, it just creates unnecessary anger with and you know American jobs are on the line, right? American companies are on the line. You talk about Apple, which has enormous market exposure in, in China, which is why Apple stock just recently dipped significantly in the fear of retaliation. And so, um, you know, if there was an actual uh, data breach, I'd probably have a different opinion on this. Uh, but you know, the bottom line is, if you're going to fight them, at least make sure that you can get something out of it. At least make sure you can have a win. And after TikTok, after WeChat, after the World Trade Organization's recent ruling, it doesn't seem like he's getting the wins that he's looking for. Now, I also want to talk about an international issue that's been going on for the last two weeks. Uh, it's it's one of the few issues that I think President Trump uh, can proudly say that he's gotten somewhat of a success signed on Wednesday uh, between Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the leaders of the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, both countries, which are both states and also, I should say, American allies. So I do want to add some context here. There's been people who've been really blowing this out of proportion. Neither of those Arab countries have been at war ever with Israel. Now, it is true that they didn't officially recognize Israel, but they have been undercover collaborating with Israel for decades now. Uh, all of these countries, by the way, are enemies, sworn enemies of Iran. So this was really, you know, four countries coming together and presenting a united front against Iran. Now, President Trump has been the toughest president on Iran in American history, so none of this is surprising, uh, but there have been some people who say that the president deserves a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for at least, you know, getting an official uh, in writing approval of recognizing Israel from two more Gulf states. So right now, that brings the tally up to four, I believe, four Arab countries, four Arab countries that have recognized Israel. That would be Egypt and Jordan, which recognized Israel decades ago after uh, a bunch of bloody wars in the region. And now we have two Gulf states that have also recognized Israel, mostly because of their uh, collective need to counter Iran's influence in the Middle East. Uh, so what kind of gives this entire issue a lot of context is the fact that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo recently came out and, and said that he was basically going to reimpose maximum pressure sanctions on the Iranian government. Uh, and, and this was after America pulled out of the JCPOA, also known as the Iran deal, uh, to the chagrin of basically every other nation in the deal, including American allies, such as the UK, France, and Germany, who have all come out and voted Against the United against the United States at the United Nations, so this really was a very controversial move that hardly got any support around the world except from Israel and a couple of Arab nations. Uh, so Iran right now is under incredible economic pressure. These sanctions are crippling, uh, and recently there was some news about Iran uh, forming an economic alliance with China. China has been coming in and, and really trying to help Iran economically in, in the wake of a power vacuum in the region. We also know the Russians have a close relationship with Iran. They've also been trying to defend Iran at the United 
Nations Security Council, although not as successfully. Uh, so, Mark, why don't we start off with you? What do you think is the end game here? So, Trump has obviously been very successful in 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 coalition of Israel and Arab countries counter on. Uh, these sanctions seem to be extremely devastating for the Iranian civilians. Um, what's the yeah? End so game? this is a brilliant strategy, whether you're a hawkish person or a, even a dove, because by maybe not unifying, but gathering nations with a common goal, and that goal includes holding back not just Iran and its allies, but also foreign interference in the Middle East from the Russians through Iran, and even the Chinese who have been interested in starting uh, collaborations with countries siding with Iran, all because of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is very important. And if you're a hawkish person, this is a brilliant strategy because these countries, Israel, UAE, they're countries that can be used as a military weapon against Iran if something were to happen. Um, but if you're a dove, this is also a brilliant strategy because by consolidating power in the Middle East to support peace and stability could uh, be enough for the United States to leave the Middle East without causing war in the region. So it really depends on the administration that stays in power or gets to be in power after this election. Uh, I believe Trump has been very hawkish. I know Mike Pompeo has been very hawkish. I'm not entirely sure what the Biden administration would be like. It would probably be less hawkish, but still pretty aggressive uh, against Iran and especially Russia and China. So we're just going to have to see what happens in the future. But Either way, what has happened in the past week or so has been very good for the United States because it's just consolidating our influence in the region and it's connecting these nations that we've been working with for decades that are finally working together to push not just our agenda, but the agenda of peace and stability. So I think that, you know, the entire context of this whole uh, deal with Iran is, you know, we entered into this deal with Obama. And when he was president, there was this idea that if, if we could get Iran to stop developing nuclear weapons, which you could improve the relationship between the U.S. and Iran and possibly between Iran and some of its other uh, regional, seeing that relations with Iran did somewhat improve under Obama, but once Trump came into power, it was a completely different agenda by the treaty or not, because Trump's philosophy is Iran is a threat uh, to look at the long-term implications of the Abraham Accords and whether this maximum pressure strategy on Iran ends up working. We do know that Iran has now decided to leave the Iran deal. They've been increasing uranium stockpiling, so you know, pushing them too hard, you know, there is this risk of retaliation and also um, assassinating the Iranian rock. Uh, so, so the question is to see increased uh, altercations in the region and, and peace will be unfortunately impossible to achieve. We also see that China and Russia's influence in the region has grown in the wake of Iran's isolation. So that's also something to think about, about whether this deal really achieves what it wants to achieve. Let's not forget, if the powers that be in the Middle East are convinced into recognizing Israel as a state, which this administration, believe it or not, is well on track to accomplishing, that is a golden opportunity for Palestinians to renegotiate terms for their own sovereignty and to re-stabilize their communities, which have tragically endured constant hardship and suffering since the founding of Israel in 1948. This concludes our weekly roundup from the Eureka Group podcast. In addition to national and international news, we also have the Eureka Exchange, where we bring in multiple perspectives to share dialogue on a complex issue. 
We have exclusive guest sessions from experts and entrepreneurs in a multitude of fields. And last but not least, we have Eureka Reflections, where we talk about the reception and cultural impact of media such as movies and video games. We upload new content every week on Spotify, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, Pocket Cast, and Anchor.fm, where you can support the show directly with a donation of your choice. This has been Evan, Mark, and Andrew. Thank you so much for listening, and we sincerely hope to have you again.